Hello, and welcome to Beach House 34, the show that dives deep into true crime cases, revealing the truths behind crimes that reveal shocking secrets. Stories sure to make you just a little more paranoid, and maybe even lose sleep. Here is your host, Christine. Hello to all of the new subscribers, and hello to the rest of the Beach House 34 family. If you enjoy this podcast and find yourself coming back time and time again, please like and subscribe wherever you choose to listen, whether it's on your favorite podcast platform or through YouTube. It means a lot and lets me know that you enjoy what you're hearing. So thank you. Gilgo Beach on Long Island, New York, is a popular tourist destination. During the summertime especially, Locals and visitors alike, they all head to Gilgo Beach for some R&R, enjoy the activities, the food, and especially the vast views of the Atlantic Ocean. What they didn't know was that not far from where they had picnics and relaxed on the sand, the remains of several people surrounded them. Some of the remains were whole, others had been savagely dismembered. It wouldn't be until 2010 that a series of discoveries were made that led police to the conclusion that they had a serial killer on their hands. What they didn't know is if it was just a single one or if there were more operating in the area. This is the story of the Long Island serial killer and the Gilgo Beach Four. On July 9th, 2007, a woman named Maureen Brainerd Barnes, 25, a mom of two and a paid escort via Craigslist, was reported missing. She had started to offer escort services to pay her bills after she had received an eviction notice. The day she went missing, she had planned, quote, to spend the day in New York City and was never seen again. Three days earlier, on July 6, 2007, Maureen was contacted by a burner cell phone. Between July 6 and July 9, 16 different interactions happened between Maureen's phone and this burner cell phone. The last time Maureen's own phone pinged was in Midtown Manhattan near the 59th Street Bridge. There was no further activity on her phone until July 12th of 2007. Now on this day, two calls were made from her cell phone. One of these calls pinged near the Long Island Expressway. That same month, a friend of hers received a phone call from a man that said he had just seen Maureen. She was alive and staying at, quote, a whorehouse in Queens. Two years later, also in July, but in 2009, Melissa Bartholomew, also an escort who advertised on Craigslist, lined up an out call for $1,000. She had been contacted by a burner cell phone. Three days later, on July 6th, and then again on the 9th, and then again on the 10th, the last day she was seen alive, she was contacted again by this same burner cell phone. Melissa, when she had left, had only said that she was heading to Long Island. Her family hadn't heard from Melissa for a couple of days and had begun to worry. Now, not long after Melissa went missing, her younger sister, Amanda, received a phone call from Melissa's phone. The voice on the other end was not her sister, but rather a man who asked, quote, Are you a whore like your sister? I heard you're a half-breed. These phone calls would continue to Amanda on four other occasions and usually happened around dinner time. The man would only stay on the phone for about a minute to a minute and a half. The person that he would speak to only was Amanda. His final phone call in August of that same year said, I finally killed your sister. I'm going to watch her body rot and that he may come and show Amanda someday, personally. A year later, in May of 2010, Shannon Gilbert didn't show up at home, as she had promised. Her mom and her sisters had waited for her, but as time grew late, there was no sign of Shannon. 
Shannon, 23, from Jersey City, New Jersey, worked as an escort and advertised her services on Craigslist. The night of May 2, 2010, she took a job that was located within a gated community on Long Island called Oak Beach, about seven miles west of Gilgo Beach, which sits on the south shore of Long Island. Shannon had her own driver, Michael Pack, who took her to the location. Shannon arrived at her client, Joseph Brewer's, home around 2 a.m. Two and a half hours later, Shannon ran from the home screaming that someone was trying to kill her. The entire time, she has 911 on the phone. She had called them while she was still in Brewer's house and had told 911 that they were trying to kill her. Now, Shannon's initial phone call to 911 came in at 4.51 a.m. Shannon then runs to various houses within the area and knocks on doors, still saying that someone is trying to kill her. She doesn't know exactly where she is, so her phone call is routed through different precincts. Her entire 911 call lasts for over 20 minutes. As Shannon is running from house to house within this gated community of Oak Beach, she ends up at the at the home of a former physician. So she's knocking on his door. His name is Peter Hackett. Now, Peter said that he brought her inside and treated her with medication to calm her down. So here's a woman, obviously in distress, knocking on your door in the early hours of the morning. And you say, hey, come on in. I can help you. Let me give you some medication. Doesn't that sound a little off? Shannon's mom, worried about her daughter, phones the police and files a missing persons report. So two days after Shannon went missing, this doctor actually called Shannon's mom, Mari, telling her that he, quote, ran a home for wayward girls and that Shannon was being taken care of. So somehow this former doctor had her phone or at least had somehow gotten her mom's phone number, right? He further told Mari that Shannon had left with her driver, but that she had left in a confused state of mind. Now, three days later, this Hackett guy again calls Mari, again, Shannon's mom, and told her that he never had any contact with her daughter and that he had never called Mari before that day. Now, phone records would reveal later that Hackett was lying. Local rumors ran rampant. I mean, the entire town of Oak Beach began to believe that someone was covering up something. And there was a particular house within the community that had been singled out as having had lots of parties that included drinking and drugs and women. Many of the local residents would show up at these parties, and this home just happened to be located in a very isolated spot. But the fact is that Shannon is still missing. On June 6th of 2010, this is almost a month to the day that Shannon first left her home, Megan Waterman, 22, of South Portland, Maine, also went missing. The day before she went missing, she had told her boyfriend that she was going out and would call him later on. Megan had placed an advertisement on Craigslist as an escort. The day of her disappearance, she had been staying at a motel in Hawpog, I hope I said that right, New York, which was just about uh, 15 miles or so north of Gilgo Beach. Now, the day before, when she told her boyfriend that she was heading out, Megan had received a phone call from a burner cell phone, which had just been activated that day. On June 6th, around 1.31 in the morning, Megan is seen on surveillance video leaving her motel. Megan, too, was reported missing. Three months later, on September 2nd, 2010, Amber Lynn Costellos, 27, also a sex worker, went missing. Now, what happened with Amber is the day before, on September 1st of 2010, she too was contacted by a burner cell phone. The day that Amber went missing on September 2nd, 
her phone received yet another call from this burner phone at around 12.05 a.m. Now, witnesses told police that a client had showed up at Amber's house in West Babylon, New York. This client arrived at Amber's home and went inside. Now, what the client didn't know, however, was that this was all a setup. After the client had walked into the home, a man who pretended to be the outraged boyfriend of Amber, it was her pimp actually, showed up. Now, the client, not wanting to get into any confrontation with this quote-unquote boyfriend, turned to her and said, hey, he's just a friend, and just tell her I'll give her a call. And then the client left the residence. Amber, in the meantime, had kept the money that the client had already paid. So after this client leaves, Amber gets a text, and the text says, that was not so nice. Do I get credit for next time? According to witnesses, later that day of September 2nd, Amber was again contacted by this same client. And according to the witness, Amber told us he had wanted to see her again, but he didn't want to come back to the house because of her boyfriend. So that night, around 11.30 p.m., Amber left her home without her purse and without her cell phone. Amber, too, would go missing. Now, the search has still continued for Shannon. It wasn't until a month after Shannon was first reported missing that the Suffolk County Missing Persons Bureau asked an officer to perform a search for Shannon in the area where she had last been seen. Now, over that summer of 2010, the officer and his canine had searched this gated community where Shannon had last been seen, but they didn't find anything. It took the police four months to connect Shannon's 911 call to her missing persons report. Now, once they connected who Shannon had been with that evening, both Joseph Brewer, Shannon's client, and Michael Pack, Shannon's driver, they were both given lie detector tests and they passed. Shannon was not found. Then on December 11th of 2010, and this was months later, the canine officer who had originally searched for Shannon in Oak Beach headed to a remote area off of Ocean Parkway for a training exercise because this area was close to where Shannon had disappeared in May. Now, the canine named Blue alerted to a scent, and as the officer followed him, they came across a skeleton that was found wrapped in burlap. The burlap was camouflaged, and it's kind of the sort that hunters would use uh, or might use for blinds. These remains were not of Shannon, however, but would later be identified as belonging to 24-year-old Melissa Bartholomew, who had disappeared in July of 2009. Now, this discovery of Melissa led to the area being searched more thoroughly And on December 13th of 2010, three days after discovering Melissa, they discovered three more bodies, none of them being Shannon. These additional women were all found on Gilgo Beach. Each had the same type of burlap wrapped around them. They were spaced about 500 feet apart from one another, and each of them had worked as escorts. These bodies would later be identified as Maureen Brainerd Barnes, 25, Melissa Bartholomew, 24, Megan Waterman, 22, and Amber Lynn Costello, 27. And these four women would later be referred to as the Gilgo Beach Four. So, did they ever find Shannon? Yes, they did. Shannon's remains were located in Oak Beach, in December of 2011, 19 months after she had disappeared. Now, Shannon was located in a marshy area that had incredibly tall wooden reeds, and she was not found far from Dr. Hackett's home, the doctor who said that he ran this home for a wayward girls and that he said he had given Shannon some medication, you know, to calm her down. It all sounds really fishy, right? Well, Hackett, this 
this guy was known as a person who liked to get himself involved and purposefully inserted himself into events, but the police didn't consider him a suspect in Shannon's murder. Now, Shannon's death, however, was not connected to the Gilgo Beach Four. The police believed that her death was totally unrelated to the other bodies that had been located. They thought that Shannon had either been too drunk or she had been on drugs and paranoid, uh, so much so that she had just run out into the marsh, got stuck, and because of the outdoor elements, had succumbed to them. Now, the police commissioner even believed that, quote, Shannon had an episode because she was bipolar. Now, here's the thing, though. Shannon's autopsy revealed absolutely no drugs in her system. And this kind of hits on both sides. You know, first, that Shannon personally herself had not taken anything. And also, second, that the information from the doctor where he said he had brought her inside and given her something to calm her down was a lie. Now, the Gilbert family, Shannon's family, uh, not believing that she had died of a quote-unquote episode, uh, did have an independent autopsy done. And this autopsy said that Shannon had a crushed hyoid bone, which typically indicates strangulation. But as it stands now, Shannon's case is not a part officially of the Gilgo Beach case or the Long Island ser serial killer case. So we'll see. Their family's... Um, working on on some things regarding that so anyhow the gilgo beach four however they were not the only bodies to have been found in the area and this does not include shannon years earlier other remains had been found on the island the first being the remains of who they call fire island jane doe now on april 20th of 1996 a black plastic garbage bag was found in Davis Park on what is called Fire Island in Long Island, New York. Now, this, this garbage bag contained two severed legs. These remains were not identified and thus given the name Fire Island Jane Doe. Uh, it was, she was also given the name Jane Doe Number 7. One of the legs had a surgical scar on it, so at least they had a little something to go with. It wasn't until April 11th of 2011. So remember, these her severed legs were found in 1996. It's now 2011 that a skull was found on in Tubay Beach. Now, Tubay Beach sits just west of Gilgo Beach. DNA testing would determine that the severed legs found in 1996 and the skull found in 2011 belonged to the same woman. Fire Island Jane Doe, also referred to as Jane Doe number seven. She has never been identified. Then in June of 1997, at Hempstead State Park in the town of Lakeview, New York, the torso of a young African American woman was found in a green plastic Rubbermaid container. Hempstead State Park is about 34 miles northwest of Fire Island. Now, these remains were also not identified, uh, but given the name Peaches and Jane Doe number three. Now, the name Peaches came from a tattoo that was located on her left breast. On April 11th, 2011, the same month and year as the discovery of Fire Island Jane Doe, a set of skeletal remains were found inside a plastic bag near Jones Beach State Park and given the name Jane Doe number three. Now, these remains were located about six miles south of the Gilgo Beach Four. DNA testing in 2016 determined that Peaches and Jane Doe number three were the same person. She, too, has never been identified. In the summer of 2000, a woman by the name of Valerie Mack, who also went by the name Melissa Taylor, went missing. Just a few months later, in November, a torso was found in a garbage bag and dumped in the woods in Manorville, which is 44 miles northeast of Gilgo Beach. Now, because these remains were identified, unidentified, sorry about that, they were given the name Jane Doe No. 6. Just like the other discoveries in April of 2011, a head, hands, and a right foot 
were located, and DNA testing later determined that the female torso found in 2000 and the recent find of body parts all belonged to the same woman who ended up being Valerie Mack, also known as Melissa Taylor, also known as Jane Doe number six. Now, this is important. It'll come, become important later. But Valerie had been last seen about 17 miles from Atlantic City. In July of 2003, a woman by the name of Jessica Taylor went missing. Now, this same month, Jessica's torso, missing both her head and her hands, were also found in Manorville. Now, Jessica's remains were found on top of a pile of scrap wood and underneath her was some plastic sheeting. Now, she too had a tattoo, but it had been mutilated, unlike the tattoo of Peaches. In March of 2011, a skull, a pair of hands, and a forearm were located and were later identified as belonging to Jessica. And if this weren't enough, also in April of 2011 at Gilgo Beach and very close to where the Gilgo Beach Four were located was the body of a young Asian male who had died from blunt force trauma. Now, this victim was found wearing women's clothing. He was between 17 and 23 years old. And after some testing had been done, it was determined that he had been dead between five and 10 years. He too has never been identified. And what could possibly be uh, the worst find of all of this uh, was that uh, on April 4th of 2011, the skeletal remains of a female toddler had been located. Uh, the toddler was found near Valerie Mack in, in Manorville. Uh, the do- toddler didn't have any signs of trauma uh, and was wrapped in a blanket. Now, this toddler, however, had been wearing gold earrings and a gold necklace, which after DNA tests, was actually later determined to be the child of Peaches. Peaches and her child were located over seven miles apart from one another. On November 29th of 2011, police announced that they believed it to be one person who was responsible for all 10 of these murders and that the perpetrator is almost certainly from Long Island. The police believed in the single killer theory because of common characteristics between the condition of the remains and the forensic evidence related to the bodies. Now, personally, I don't see how this is even possible. The remains found, at least between uh, Gilgo Beach and the dismembered bodies, they were quite different. Those found at Gilgo Beach, those women had been strangled. Uh, They were all close together and they were all not dismembered. Uh, The other bodies were found dismembered and strewn about the location. All of these victims, including the four located on Gilgo Beach, are collectively referred to as the Long Island Serial Killer Case, or LISK, L-I-S-K. So after years of investigation, and with all of these remains found within relative proximity to one another, the Suffolk County Police Department, SCPD, had hit a wall. They wanted some extra help, and what they wanted to do was to bring in the FBI. The problem was, the police chief at the time kept blocking the FBI from helping. You might think, well, this sounds strange. Why why would they do that? Well, it turns out that the police chief at the time, James Burke, was being investigated by the FBI himself. What had happened is a junkie named Loeb had stolen items from Burke's police vehicle. Now, the items that were stolen included his gun belt, magazines of ammunition, a box of of cigars, a humidor, and a duffel bag that contained porn, DVDs, sex toys, and pornography magazines. Now, Loeb was arrested in December of 2012 at his mom's house, and this is where they found Burke's items, along with several other items stolen from various other vehicles. Now, when Burke heard about Loeb being busted, he wanted to make sure that his bag of smut wasn't located. So what he did is he went to Loeb's mom's house, 
where the items were found and he tampered with the evidence, including grabbing his bag and other belongings. After he did this, Burke then went to the police station where Loeb had been taken. Now, Loeb had been handcuffed and he was manacled to the floor. So when Burke entered the room, he just immediately attacked Loeb. He shook his head violently. He punched him in the head and his body and tried to knee him. Burke also knew that he was a heroin addict, so he then threatened to give him a hot shot, which is an overdose of drugs laced with poison. Now, Loeb, he's unable to fight back because he's all cuffed up, still called Burke a pervert and mentioned a one piece of porn that Loeb thought was that of an underage child. At this point, Burke went totally out of control. He was screaming, he was cursing and assaulting Loeb until a detective finally stepped up and said, that's enough. After this incident, Burke would then brag about what he did to Loeb to other cops and even mentioned that it reminded him of his old days as a young police officer. Burke then forced lower level officers to get their quote story straight so that Burke remained in the clear and he even intimidated them so bad that one witness even lied under oath on the witness stand. In October of 2015, Burke resigned. But up until that time, he had refused to allow the FBI to help in the investigation of the Gilgo Beach Four. And the reason he didn't want the FBI involved was, as was mentioned, he knew the FBI was also investigating him. On December 9th of 2015, Burke was arrested for civil rights violations and conspiracy. And two days later, he was even denied bail. A year later, in November of 2016, he was sentenced to 46 months in prison. The day after Burke was arrested, not sentenced, but arrested, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Tim Seney announced that the FBI had officially joined the investigation. With the FBI now available to help, the investigation moved forward rather quickly. In 2017, a man named John Bitrolf was named as a suspect. Now, Bitrolf is currently in prison, having been convicted in 2017 of the murders of two sex workers, um, Rita Tangretti and Colleen McNamee. And these murders occurred in 1993 and 1994. On September 12th of 2017, the Suffolk County prosecutor from the county district attorney's office announced that John Bitrolf, who was, uh, he was a carpenter, had lived in Manorville on Long Island. He was a suspect in at least one of the murders in the area, aside from the ones that he'd already been convicted of. The torsos of Jessica Taylor and Valerie Mack that we spoke of earlier were located only about three miles from his house. Now, in a weird twist, one of Bitrolf's victims had an adult daughter who was close friends with Melissa Bartholomew, one of the Gilgo Four. On January 16th of 2020, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Geraldine Hart released images of a belt found at the crime scene that had the letters H-M or W-H. And the reason why it's an or is because it depends on the orientation of the belt. And these uh, letters were embossed in black leather. The belt had been found during the initial investigation near Ocean Parkway in Gilgo Beach. Police believe that this belt had been handled by the perpetrator and that it had not belonged to any of the victims. But they didn't really reveal very many details about where the belt was or where it stood in regards to evidence. Um, and they wouldn't even comment on exactly where it had been found. So in 2021, the police find out that uh, many of these women had been contacted using various burner phones. Um, evidently, this person would get a different burner phone for each of his victims. Eventually, the police were able to narrow down at least a, a couple of these burner phones. 
And it was discovered that during work days, some of these burner phones were pinging in a really small area around Midtown Manhattan. And at night, they were pinging around a an area around Massapequa Park in New York. So eventually, they had narrowed down this, this small area within the Massapequa Park area uh, to just a few hundred homes as to where these, these phones were pinging from. But it wasn't until 2022 that a major break came in the case. Now, the police, they had a new interview with Amber Costello's roommate and pimp who said that a John who had come to their house in Babylon on September 1st, 2010, the day before Amber disappeared, uh, he essentially went on to describe him. And remember, this is the guy that they had set up the ruse where he pretended to be her boyfriend and then Amber stole the money and Amber later then took off with this guy. The client was described as ogre-like with dark, bushy hair, big oval style 1970s type glasses he was a white man approximately six foot four to six foot six in his mid 40s and he was driving a green chevy avalanche that he had parked in the driveway of their home so using older maps within google search a green avalanche that had been described to the police was actually found parked in front of an address in Massapequa Park, New York, right within the area where the burner phones had been pinging. So six weeks later was when the name Rex Hewerman was first mentioned. Court documents reveal that Hewerman had a number of online accounts and burner cell phones and all in fictitious names. He did use his own name to make payments to uh, via Google Pay to like tinder but used the fake name of tinder on tinder of andy so these tinder accounts had burner phones linked to the fake name of andrew roberts and interestingly hewerman's middle name is andrew another fake account uh this time an email was listed under john springfield and yet another burner phone attached to it that doesn't have a named subscriber Um, A third email account and burner phone was set up under the name Thomas Hawk. Now, this account was used to conduct thousands of searches related to sex workers, sadistic torture-related pornography, as well as child pornography. Additionally, he used this account to conduct more than 200 searches between March 2022 and June 2023, all related to active and known serial killers. The disappearances and murders of Maureen, Melissa, Megan, and Amber, as well as the investigation into these murders. He also did searches for a number of podcasts and or documentaries regarding the investigation. Uh, Because these searches happened within such a small time frame, it could be that he was starting to feel the heat. He was getting nervous. Uh, maybe he did feel and knew that he was being investigated. In May of 2023, he was further linked to a yet another burner cell phone when he was seen by law enforcement via video surveillance at a cell phone store in Manhattan purchasing additional minutes for this one burner phone. He continued to let his curiosity get the best of him uh, when he visited this website called gilgonews.com. It's a website uh, maintained by the police to give news related to the investigation. His home IP address was used on both May 23rd and July 3rd of 2020 to visit the site. So how did the arrest happen? Well, happen. Well, the evening of July 13th, uh, 2023, Rex Hewerman, a 59-year-old architect, was arrested for three of the four victims called the Gilgo Beach Four. Now, while he hasn't been officially tied to the fourth victim, it's likely that he will be. But, you know, right now, that's just speculation. At the time of his arrest... He did have a burner phone on him that had been linked to one of his email accounts that police already knew about. 
One of the most incriminating pieces of evidence was that of hairs from a man and a woman that were found when the bodies were first discovered, but they had not yet been able to trace this hair to individuals. Once they had pinpointed who they were looking for, they followed their suspect for some time until he discarded some items that may have contained his DNA. Now, in July of 2022, an undercover detective recovered 11 bottles from the trash outside of Hurman's house. Now, the Suffolk County Crime Lab took swabs of these bottles, and these swabs were then sent to a forensic lab for DNA profiling. The lab concluded that one of the DNA profiles from the bottles indicated a female and which matched hairs recovered from three of the victims. The hairs actually matched with Hewerman's wife. In January of 2023, a team that had Hewerman under surveillance watched as he went and threw out a pizza box into a garbage can in Manhattan. And inside the box, they found a pizza crust he had not yet consumed that contained his DNA and which matched DNA found on the burlap from the victims. Once Hewerman became an official person of interest, the police then executed over 300 subpoenas and search warrants pertaining to him. They discovered that within a 14-month period, during the same time the police were attempting to track him, his online activity showed that he had performed over 200 searches pertaining to the Gilgo investigation. Some of these searches were, why hasn't the Long Island serial killer been caught? Long Island killer, Long Island serial killer phone call, serial killers by state 2023, unsolved serial killer cases, 11 currently active serial killers, which is, I don't know why he would choose that number, but John Bitroff, so we know that name, right? Megan Waterman, FBI active serial killers. Why could law enforcement not trace the calls made by the Long Island serial killer? He searched for Melissa. He searched for Ma Maureen. And during his fake online, using his fake online profiles, he would search for things like, and these are only the things that were unredacted, pretty girl with bruised face, porn, torture, redhead porn. So I'll just let your imagination kind of take it from there as to what the rest of them might have been. So in one of those searches um, that he performed sounded familiar. You'd be right because Hewerman searched on John Bitroff, the man who had been accused of killing two women. Now, there's no doubt that he was keeping a very close eye on everything that was related to cases in the Gilgo Beach area. Hewerman was married. He had two kids and he worked as an architect in Manhattan. And what he would do is when his wife was out of town, he would commit his crimes. He and his family, they all lived together in his childhood home in Massapequa Park. And this is an area directly north of Gilgo Beach. But Massapequa Park is stateside. It's not actually on Long Island itself. This place that he lived is known as a very quiet neighborhood. You know, boy, where haven't we heard that, right? And so when police and groups of officials begin to arrive in like these white hazmat like suits, of course, the neighborhood was just in shock. So far, what we know is that locked inside a walk in vault in his basement were 279 guns, 92 of them he had licenses for. He also paid for two storage facilities in Amityville, Long Island, and the police are now searching those storage areas to see if they can locate any trophies. So something, you know, that a serial killer would take from their victims as a souvenir of the crime. The three women he's currently charged with murdering are Melissa, Megan, and Amber. He is not yet charged with the killing of Maureen. Now, since his arrest, Kierman's wife has filed divorce papers. Uh, her sister briefly spoke with the television news crew saying that they didn't know anything. They're just hearing about this information on the news like everyone else. And police wanted to know if Hurman 
is connected to the additional six victims found along the same stretch of road. The victims, you know, Peaches, Fire Island Jane Doe, the unidentified Asian male, Jessica Taylor, Valerie Mack, and of course, the female toddler. However, we do know that John Bitrolf is also being investigated for potentially two of these murders, uh, but that still leaves four without any potential suspects, at least that we know of, right? They are also interested in finding out if Hurman had any involvement with victims in Atlantic City. Now, you might be wondering, what? Atlantic City? Yeah, well, first, if you remember when we were talking about the victims earlier, uh, not the ones referred to as the Gilgo Beach Four, but the others who had been found in the vicinity, the name Valerie Mack came up. And if you remember, she was last seen outside of Atlantic City before ending up in Long Island. Four women in Atlantic City were found in a ditch just outside of the city. All of them were barefoot, barefoot and fully clothed. All of their heads had been turned to face towards the casinos of Atlantic City. Now, plus, one of the victims named Kim Raffo had spent time at a Long Island hotel before she was found dead in Atlantic City. So four women all in a ditch with at least one tied to Long Island. Now, currently, the police won't talk about the relation between Hewerman and the women found in Atlantic City. But with that information, we further know that the Gilgo case has now expanded to South Carolina and Nevada. Uh, Hewerman had purchased a home in South Carolina in 2022 with the goal of retiring there near his brother. And police secured a vehicle that they had found there. Hewerman also owns a timeshare in Las Vegas and the police there are reviewing cases for any possible connection. Hewerman is due back in court in August of 2023, but to be honest, it's likely none of this would have happened. None of these discoveries would have been made, at least as early as they were, if it weren't for the initial search for Shannon Gilbert. Now, the Lisk case uh, continues to be researched. As for the Gilgo Beach 4, we know that someone has been caught and evidence and information continues to be released on a near daily basis. It remains to be seen, however, if Hurman will be linked to any other cases nearby in Atlantic City, Las Vegas, or South Carolina. So as important information comes up, I'll be sure to absolutely share it with you all on Instagram. And that's it for this episode. Thank you, thank you, thank you all for listening. Uh, the sources for this article will be located on the Beach House 34 podcast Instagram bio link. Um, and please don't forget to like and subscribe to be updated on all future episodes. Thank you.